Hello everybody, Nick here at Scott and Dickie. We appreciate you stopping by for another one of our weekly tech videos right before we head off for SEMA. Now, this video to me is kind of a big deal. Not because we're showing anything too extravagant or too expensive here, mostly because it's such a controversial topic. Now, you've probably heard in the previous videos where I've talked about engine bearings and cranks and piston rings where I've kind of led up to this video and talking about where it could be controversial. And you might be thinking, why? What is the point? of something like this being controversial. It's pretty set in stone, isn't it? Engine break-in. Well, no, it actually isn't. <clears throat> See, the problem is you can get a lot of different answers and theories when it comes to engine break-in. Believe me, among engine builders, not all of them, but for a lot of them, this is like walking into a bar and discussing politics or religion. You're not gonna change anybody's mind and you're probably gonna leave with a black eye. But let's discuss some of that, the general theory of it, and along the way discuss the do's and don'ts of this kind of process, and maybe even dispel a couple myths that we hear time and time again. Now, first things first, let's talk about what you're actually breaking in, or running in, as some people also say. What you're actually breaking in when you first run an engine is what you can see here piston rings. This is an LS7 engine that we've, you know, used on shows in years past. They no longer use these, so we keep them here in our showroom just to have something, you know, nice and cool in the background to show everybody and our customers. But it's good because a nice little cutaway where you can see here the piston rings running into the cross hatch finish, that hone finish that you have on your cylinder walls, that is actually what you're breaking in. A lot of people will say, well, you're also breaking in, you know, your piston or piston skirt here to the cylinder wall. Not exactly, you're not really wearing that in either. That is supposed to also have a thin film of uh, oil on it, coated at all times while it's running. So no, you don't want metal to metal contact on those either. Some people say it's engine bearings. Well, no, if you remember from our bearing video, I said that as well. Your bearings actually should never touch metal to metal. So you're not wearing those in either. Really what you are wearing in is just the piston rings. And yes, if you're running a flat tap at camshaft, you do have to do a special braking procedure to wear in the flat face of those lifters to the lobe surface of the camshaft. We're not really gonna be going over that today, mostly because modern engines haven't used those since the 90s, when you're talking about Ford, Chevy, Dodge, anybody. So, for the time being, we're gonna leave camshaft braking kind of off to the side a bit. We're mostly talking about brand new engine braking, whether you're talking race shop engines from us or Chevrolet Performance. So. When it comes to that, the next myth that we want to dispel is the kind of oils you use. As you can see here, I have some Maxima break-in oil, some 10 to be 30, and even have some BR50 Joe Gibbs driven. Now, of course, both of these are great. We keep these in stock. I've actually ran both of these in several engines that I've built and broken in. I haven't ran into really any issues. But one of the big myths that we hear about is that you cannot break an engine on synthetic. Now, without trying to confuse too many of y'all, Synthetic is actually just the process in which they make the oil. Conventional is where they take petroleum product from the ground and refine it into what you end up in a bottle here. Synthetic is just the same thing, but it's lab formed instead of starting with the stuff out of the ground, kind of. I know that sounds kind of weird, but as long as it is a break-in specific oil, they do make synthetic break-ins. Syn break-in oils specifically have additives like zinc or ZDDP that you've probably heard of, as well as others, to help break in an engine, to help those rings wear in, while also having other additives to protect stuff like the piston skirts, the bearings, your valve train, like rocker arms and valve springs and whatnot. So break in specific oil is what you're looking for. If you're asking about the weight, that's another myth we hear a lot about. People go, well, no, you need to run like a thin one, like a 5W30. It doesn't matter what the engine's built for, run it thin, and other people go, no, you gotta run it thin. You have to make sure it's protected. I don't care what it's built for. You run the thick stuff. It's gotta be like molasses. You can barely hear the stuff moving here. That's not the case either. You run the same weight that the engine's built for. Remember, your engine builder, whether it be Chevrolet Performance or us or whoever, they set bearing tolerances and clearances throughout this engine for certain weight oils. You make sure to use roughly that same weight on your engine break-in. Now, another myth we hear about engine oil break-in, some people say that once you run this in, you have to change it very quick in like 50 to 100 miles and then run conventional for the next few oil changes and then you can go to synthetic. Others say, now nah, use this stuff for a thousand miles and immediately go to synthetic. What is the procedure? Well, actually, there's a lot of different theories on this. I can tell you that Chevrolet Performance will tell you to run their oils on an engine break in oil 
for maybe 100 to up to 500 miles. Keep in mind, braking oils are not meant to last as long as 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 miles like some modern day oils. So you were not meant to run braking oils that long. Actually, you'd probably want to change it out anyway, because I will tell you, it doesn't matter who manufactured it, what race shop or engine shop built it, there's no such thing as perfection. You will have little bits of debris on your first oil change. It can actually be kind of shocking. The first few that I built, believe me, when you change your oil, you think you might have ruined something. It's just part of that braking procedure. It is these rings and cylinders you know, wearing into themselves. It is little bits of debris from the machining process, even though they can clean it a million times, there's always gonna be something hidden. It is gonna fall into that oil catch in the oil filter, catching your oil. The thing is, is the break-in procedure on modern piston rings, like we talked about in our last video, does happen pretty quick. 50, 100, 150 miles tops. After that, there's no point in continuing to run the break-in oil. Go ahead and change it. I can tell you that some do say go to conventional, some get, say to go synthetic. We here know that you can go to a synthetic. It is up to you though, it is your personal choice whether to go to conventional oil or a synthetic oil. So that is not as detrimental as you might think. Now when it comes to the break-in procedure, how do you do it? Some people say you have to baby these things, that you fire them up and you drive them really easy and you do it for thousands of miles. Other people say fire it up, drive it like you stole it. You know, beat the pants off of it, that's what it needs. It's actually kind of a combination of that stuff. Chevrolet Performance, as well as other manufacturers, will tell you when it comes to the break-in procedure on their engines, it actually is the same as a lot of different race shops that we've talked to. I've been fortunate enough to work for a lot of great people over the years. They've taught me a lot that I know, and I'm learning more and more as I'm working with this great company. And I can tell you that everybody's break-in procedure seems to follow very similar guidelines. They might vary here or there, but it seems they all have the same theory. They want you to fire it up, they want you to check for leaks first. Coolant leaks, oil leaks, fuel leaks. Gotta make sure it's safe and gotta make sure while you're driving it, you're not gonna run into any issues. While you're checking for those leaks, you're letting that engine get up to operating temperature. Once it gets up to operating temperature, go drive it. The purpose is to run in these piston rings. You don't wanna do it at idle. You also don't wanna do it at highway speeds. You don't want low load, consistent RPM. That is what you're trying to avoid. So what do you do? In town driving. You drive it like you would every day. You know, run it through the gears, run it back down through the gears. You're not going wide open throttle, but you're not bogging it and baiting it either. You're kind of finding a middle ground. Yes, there are some heat cycles these things go through. Some people like to run it for 20, 25 miles, turn it off, let it cool down, fire it back up and restart. There are some places that believe that that works too. The thing is we've also seen that method work as well. So that's why you hear that controversy. Well, no, this way works. Well, no, that way works. They both work. As grotesque as it sounds, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And it also is the same here. Now I can tell you, do not go wide open throttle and beat on it within the first you know, 25, 50 miles. You're not wearing this stuff in any better doing that. You actually do run the risk of you know, galling or scarring some things that are trying to get oil you know, flung around them for the first time. Keep in mind, your piston rings, your pistons, your cylinders are not lubed by pressurized oil unless you have oil piston squirters. They're actually lubed by splash oil, oil that comes off of this crankshaft where the rod bearings are. As it pressurizes the main and rods and the crank and it pushes past all that, it gets flung all over the crankcase on the inside of here. And that also happens on these cylinders and it ends up in these rings. That is how you were lubricating those cylinders. So RPM does not hurt them but low load, too high of RPM, too high of a load, stuff like that can. Now, we appreciate you stopping by for another one of our weekly tech videos. We know that this has been kind of a big video. We've been putting it off. We get a lot of questions about it, but it is good to know exactly what you need to do, what you don't need to do, and some you know misconceptions about what you're actually doing when you run in an engine. Now, please give us a like, subscribe, and share on both Facebook and YouTube. We know you ask, we ask you to do that for every video, but this is kind of special. Next week, we finally get to go back to SEMA after they you know, called it off last year for COVID. So this is a big deal. We get to see cool projects, vendors in their new products, and all sorts of stuff. SEMA is one of our favorite things to go to, and we want to make feature videos that you guys can follow. So please like, subscribe, share, ring that bell on the notification so when a new video pops up, when Dane here gets back to the hotel room and edits every night for you guys, you can see his magic and see everything for yourself. For some of y'all that unfortunately can't make it like I could in previous years. 
So we will see you next week at SEMA. Have a good one.